Welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, communications director at Breakthrough. And I'm Emma Brush, managing editor of the Breakthrough Journal. Breakthrough Dialogues invites leading thinkers to talk technological and modern solutions to environmental problems. It's part of our effort to move beyond the tribalism and polarization that too often characterizes environmental thought and politics today. If you like our show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Cast, or wherever you get your podcasts. In this episode, we talk with Varun Sivaram, Fellow for Science and Technology at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of the new book, Taming the Sun, Innovations to Harness Solar Energy and Power the Planet. We published an excerpt of Varun's book in our winter 2018 issue of the Breakthrough Journal, which warned that if the solar industry doesn't learn from the failures of nuclear energy, solar might hit barriers to growth, just like nuclear has. Varun, thanks for joining us. Alex, thanks so much for having me. So one of the things that has really inspired me to think a lot about energy in, in my career was this essay that this chemist named Richard Smalley wrote over 10 years ago called The Terawatt Challenge, in which he posited that we need zero carbon energy technologies at the multi-terawatt scale. For context, the world uses a little over 15 terawatts of energy today. If we're going to double or triple that to power a energy-hungry planet later this century, we're going to need tens of terawatts of hopefully zero carbon clean energy. And what Richard Smalley wrote and what Nate Lewis wrote in another essay called Powering the Planet is that with technologies like hydroelectric and ocean and geothermal, you can get sort of one to two terawatts here and there. You can get a lot with wind. But for the context for this conversation, there really are no better technologies for super abundant energy than solar and nuclear. And that was the focus of your essay for the Breakthrough Journal. Obviously, the focus of your book, Taming the Sun, is solar. So what is it about solar in particular that you are enthusiastic about, Varun? Why are you optimistic about this technology? Well, first and foremost, it is the resource potential of solar that I'm so excited about. Now, I do want to say, Alex, to your point about the resource potential of these other technologies, you know, the academic literature estimates of technical potential for all of these different renewable resources varies wildly. I'm not actually sure that the resource potential of wind is incommensurate with terawatt or tens of terawatt level uh, of meeting demand. I, I actually think, you know, the estimates that say that wind could supply a large fraction of humanity's energy needs, even if that energy pie grows in the future. But the reason I'm so excited about solar energy is because it is orders of magnitude above every other source of energy we have access to. Every hour, you know, more sunlight hits the earth uh, in the form of energy than the world uses in a whole year. So my excitement over solar starts with its abundance, its resource potential, but it doesn't end there. I'm also extremely excited about solar because of the strides that have been made recently. You know, solar has recently become the cheapest, fastest growing source of energy on the planet. And I think that, you know, with continued innovation across a range of domains, solar could continue growing. I think it is the one source that has the potential uh, to provide clean energy as the largest form of humanity's primary energy demand by the end of the century. I don't think any other source can lay claim to that sort of potential. And that's why I'm so excited uh, for solar power's prospects. And as you mentioned, I do think that solar and nuclear uh, do have a lot in common and solar has a lot to learn from the nuclear experience. So on that point, Varun, um, I think your enthusiasm for solar sounds really well-founded. At the same time, as you point out in your own book, um, this kind of enthusiasm took the form of nuclear enthusiasm at the uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, so what makes the nuclear and solar experiences different? What should the solar uh, industry learn from the kind of foundering uh, nuclear industry today? Well, I want to start with what makes the nuclear and solar experiences the same. And it's exactly what you said. Uh, at the beginning uh, of the 1970s, for example, nuclear energy accounted for about 2% of the world's electricity mix. That's exactly where solar is today. And as you mentioned, in the post-war era, nuclear was going to be the next great hope for cheap, clean, abundant energy for all. That's what people hope for solar today. That's why they're the same. Now, the reason I hope they diverge is that nuclear energy experienced a stagnation 
uh, after the 1990s, after nuclear energy's share of world electricity peaked below 20% and kept falling, I believe that nuclear energy uh, had this phenomenon because its technology stopped getting better. And in the case of solar, I desperately hope that's different. I hope that solar does not have a similar technological stagnation. So even though you might say, look, solar and nuclear are two very different sources of energy, and in nuclear's case, the, the proximate reason for why nuclear has stalled is you know, accidents and activists and rising costs, well, I think that the same underlying problem that afflicted nuclear, the stagnation and inability to move beyond the light water reactor design, could similarly afflict solar. And today's silicon solar panel has become the dominant design, accounting for over 90% of all solar deployment in the same way that you know, the light water reactor uh, characterizes the vast majority of global nuclear deployment. And unless we get past, in my opinion, existing first-generation technology, both in nuclear and in solar, I don't think that you'll be able to surmount this inevitable stagnation that, in solar's case, you could top out at a percentage of the world's electricity that hover somewhere between 10 and 20% rather than continuing to grow. And in my book, I argue that it's going to take a level of on the order of 33% of solar by mid-century uh, for solar to be on track to help the world achieve its climate goals. Yeah. And you write that solar could power a huge plurality, if not even a majority of the world's energy supply later this century. What in particular is standing between us today and that hopeful eventuality. What is it about current solar technologies that you think needs to be overcome? You know, th there are a few barriers in the way. Uh, the first one I'm going to call a speed bump. Uh, this is a scarcity of capital. Today's existing investors for solar just don't have the kinds of deep pockets needed to source the trillions of dollars solar needs to keep growing from its current 2% to you know, 30% and beyond by mid-century. I think we'll get over that speed bump as financial markets, for example, find ways to bundle together solar projects into diversified portfolios that the largest investors, institutional investors, are comfortable buying and trading. I also think that you'll see you know, a new crop of corporations. They may be existing utilities. They may be you know, pure play solar developers, but you'll see a, a crop of you know, large corporations with large balance sheets that are able to uh, serve as conduits for capital. And so I think solar will get over that funding speed bump. The larger obstacle that I think solar faces between now and mid-century and beyond is a phenomenon known as value deflation. See, the problem is that even though solar is rapidly growing today, uh, the more solar you have, the more it will cannibalize its own value. And so even though solar's cost has been gently declining and should continue to decline even with existing technology, the value that it offers, for example, to electricity grids all around the world, will plummet. And if that value falls below the cost, it doesn't matter if you've got gentle cost declines. The swiftly eroding value uh, will mean that the, the marginal solar panel addition doesn't deliver as much value uh, as it costs to deploy. Let me make that concrete. You know, Initially, when you start putting solar panels on a grid, uh, they provide you pretty useful power right in the middle of the day when, for example, uh, you might have a lot of air conditioning load on a summer day. But when you have a lot of solar panels, when you're providing more than 10%, for example, of your electricity on a grid, well, then you start to saturate your customer demand right in the middle of the day from solar energy. And the marginal solar panel, when you're already meeting most of your customer demand in the middle of the day, is only going to meet more of that middle of the day demand, not your dinner time demand, which is what you really need. And so the marginal value of solar panels can drop quite sharply. To surmount that barrier, I think you've got to take a two pronged approach. You really need your solar panels, or not even panels, maybe even coatings in the future. You need that solar technology to get way cheaper. And in addition, you want the value of the solar to fall less quickly. And to arrest that value deflation effect, you want to make your energy system super flexible. I think if you follow those two strategies, improving solar technology and making a very flexible grid that has built-in storage, I think those are good ways of uh, uh, making sure that, that you know, the marginal solar panel addition or solar coating addition still delivers value in excess of its cost. So solar is still economical to keep deploying. Yeah, so this is obviously a really interesting observation that a lot of people have made in, in the last few years, your point about value deflation for solar. And I really appreciate your point that it's, it's not just cost declines that solar needs, 
those are obviously extremely helpful and have been primarily responsible for propelling the solar success that we've seen so far this century. But even as solar gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it doesn't address, uh, it doesn't address this question of value on the other side of the equation. So for you, in looking at these advanced technologies, and by my read, you're talking about technologies like perovskites, things like organic solar or solar fuels, uh, th- things like solar coating. It's not just that these technologies could one day at scale be cheaper on a per kilowatt or per kilowatt hour basis, but that they could actually control that value deflation a, a little bit. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about that and also what other forms of systemic innovation you think are needed to address the value deflation problem? Yeah, absolutely. So again, it's a two-pronged approach. First, let's make solar cheaper. Second, let's make its value fall less slowly. On the first prong, I think these new coatings, and you mentioned perovskites, these new super lightweight, flexible, dirt cheap, highly efficient coatings um, could enable solar's cost to fall way faster than it currently is, uh, enabling the cost to better outrun the value deflation effect. You could also see technological innovation, for example, in artificial fuels that enable you to store solar energy in the form of portable fuels like hydrogen or even liquid fuels that are carbon containing. Well, that's a way of storing the sun's energy and using it at a more convenient time when you need it or in a more convenient sector that's not the electricity sector, but maybe transportation. So that's a way of making solar's value fall less slowly. Similarly, concentrated solar power where you convert the sun's energy into heat That's a way, again, of storing the sun's energy in the form of heat and then generating electricity 24-7, another way of arresting value deflation. All of those technological improvements, and by the way, we already have concentrated solar power, but I think we can make it even better. Um, All of those technological improvements help to mitigate value deflation. You also asked about this systemic innovation. What are ways to make our energy systems way more flexible? I think, you know, there are probably four major buckets of things we could do. We could make our grids bigger. A bigger grid makes it easier to match up fluctuating supply and demand over larger areas. So it's uh, it, it's easier um, to prevent the value of solar from falling when you can match it up with fluctuating demand elsewhere on a larger grid. The second thing you can do is ensure that you have a really flexible and diverse mix of other generators. I call this the supporting cast to solar star, right? Where you've got, you know, natural gas plants with carbon capture technology or nuclear plants that can ramp up and down or, you know, demand response or batteries. This diverse mix of generators enables you or of resources enables you to make sure that even though solar is extremely intermittent, um, you can always ramp up and down your other resources. Hydroelectric pump storage uh, is another one. Uh, You can ramp these resources up and down to compensate for solar's volatility. Uh, the last two buckets are kind of sub- subsumed in this you know, diverse mix thing. I also think that uh, demand response or flexible demand is important to help you match up supply and demand. And that energy storage in its various incarnations, whether it's um, lithium ion batteries, hydroelectric pump storage, or even electric vehicles that are uh, you know, being deployed as fleets of mobile batteries to help support the grid. All of these are good ways to make sure that your system can flexibly and productively use your solar energy no matter when it's produced. But in the same way that you argue that we probably need new solar technologies beyond current generation silicon PV, we probably, and many of those other supporting players, need new technologies as well. Breakthrough has argued that we need to sort of fundamentally break from the existing industry around nuclear reactors, stop thinking of huge light water reactors at the gigawatt scale, start thinking more about small modular and different fuel cycles. Do you think we need sort of similar technological breaks in nuclear, in CCS, in storage? And what are you optimistic about in in those realms? Yeah, I'll I'll answer the first prong of your question, which is, do I think we need new technologies (laughs) before I tell you whether or not I'm optimistic? Mm I 100% think that new technologies would make our lives way easier, that if we had Generation 4 nuclear reactors, and you guys have done some spectacular work on this, um, that that those reactors could be modular, cheaper, more efficient, have better fuel cycle characteristics, be inherently safe, etc. Um, that would all be wonderful uh, compared with our current generation of nuclear reactors. Similarly, the cost of carbon capture and sequestration uh, needs to fall. Uh, I also think, by the way, that there are many different ways that CCS research, carbon capture and sequestration research, can proceed. Uh, But I'd love to see 
you know, ways in which uh, we find CCS technologies that are economically suitable for backing up solar power. That means we probably want to see CCS technologies with low fixed costs, um, you know, a, a high variable to fixed cost ratio, uh, because that's going to make them uh, most optimal for operating in a load following mode that helps them compensate for solar's intermittency. So yeah, I, I agree with you, um, Alex. I, I also think, by the way, that there need to be serious energy storage innovations. Mm -hmm. I think that for grid scale, seasonal or monthly energy storage, we're going to need way cheaper and larger scale solutions than lithium ion batteries. And that's why I personally think that um, you know, sodium-based flow batteries might be an earth-abundant way to do this. But, you know, th there are many possibilities for energy storage research, and I would hate to see us get locked into lithium-ion the same way that I think we've been locked into light water reactors for nuclear or getting locked into silicon solar panels uh, for solar photovoltaics. Um, so, agreed. Across the systemic innovations, there's a range of uh, innovations needed. Um, I think digital innovations you know, the use of machine learning, for example, could be the glue that brings together all of these hardware improvements and enables the system to really act flexibly. Yeah, and it's it's there where I personally encounter a couple different types of resistance to this message, a couple different types of tribalism, really. So there's the typical tribalism that we're used to, the sort of nuclear versus renewables, or thus, you know, the, the, the sort of tribal identities that we can adopt when promoting a different technology, whether it's lithium ion storage or CCS or, or whatever. Um, so there's this sort of cross technology tribalism that is mostly counterproductive, we think. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But there's also the resistance from the enthusiasts of existing technologies, which we encounter a lot at Breakthrough when we're, when we're talking about advances in nuclear energy. We, you know, we might hear from many of our friends sort of what's wrong with the nuclear technologies that we have today. They're one of the, the most abundant clean energy technologies around. Um, you hear similar things, I, th I think, from proponents of today's solar technologies or, or today's battery technology. So wh what has been your impression when arguing for innovation of, of those arguments, of that resistance, and what is your answer to it? That's a really good framework, Alex. Um, I think you've outlined two orthogonal types of tribalism. And I have to say, I think I'm anti-tribalist on the first vector and pro-tribalist in one direction in the second mm -hmm. vector. So your first kind of tribalism is tribalism between technologies. There's a nuclear tribe and there's a renewables tribe and there's like a, I don't know, fossil fuels tribe and they all argue with each other. And I am an all of the above kind of a guy who says the diverse portfolio approach is the right way to go. So we need to stop having warring tribes. Uh, and then there is a, uh, the orthogonal tribalism is we need existing technology that's a tribe across different technologies. You know, we have we need existing wind and solar and battery technology like they're good enough. And then there's a tribe that says we need advanced technologies. We need improvements. You know, I am probably a member of the latter tribe, but I try very much to to say the reasonable thing is we should do as much as we can with the tools we've got. And the tools we've got right now are existing wind, solar and battery technology, existing nuclear reactors, for example. Um, we should do as much as we can on the carbon reduction front with those tools, but we should be constantly striving for superior technologies, recognizing that those superior technologies will give us capabilities that we don't have today or at price points that we can't access today. So, you know, perhaps I'm straddling tribalism in, in both vectors, but certainly in the first one, I think the you know, dead obvious uh, conclusion is that we really need a uh, diverse all of the above strategy. And those who would argue otherwise, like I will, you know, I'll push back violently. In the case of whether we need both existing and next generation technologies, yeah, that's probably the case. But my preference is for us to achieve technological succession at a rapid pace. I would like to move through technology generations as fast as possible because. I've seen some of the cool potential in laboratories in my field, solar photovoltaics, and I read about the cool potential in other fields, for example, next generation nuclear. I really want to see the world iterate on these technologies a whole lot faster than it's currently done in these like multi-decadal cycles. Well, Varun, so you clearly have a very good read on the solar industry based on much of your past work experience and um, your work today. What what do you think is the kind of capacity within the solar industry to embrace these kind of next generation technologies to innovate <coughs> rapidly, iter iterate rapidly? 
I am a big fan of the solar industry. Um, I think that uh, often the solar industry can get conflated with other elements of an advocacy coalition, say, you know, environmental groups, and we can talk about them later, uh, that that might be a little more ideological. But in the case of the solar industry, you know, having followed this industry for over a decade, um, I have seen them, you know, effectively advocate for sensible policies. I've seen them support both R&D and deployment. For example, uh, during the advocacy efforts of the 2005 Energy Policy Act, um, and I think going forward, um, the solar industry can actually spearhead uh, sensible decarbonization policies so long as it's careful not to couple itself too closely to some of these more ideological factions. So I actually have a lot of hope now that the solar industry worldwide is a $160 billion industry in investment and growing. I have great hope that this could be the tip of the spear of sensible decarbonization policy, whether we're talking about supporting more investment in innovation uh, or, you know, supporting a carbon price. I will say uh, that recently uh, there have been some warning signs that some factions of the solar industry have not promoted policies that are entirely conducive to cost optimal decarbonization. And I have a new report out from Brookings that makes this point. For example, there are factions in the United States and worldwide, in India, for example, uh, that support protectionism. Well, that's definitely going to slow down the pace of clean energy deployment, of solar and of other clean energy technologies. Um, I've seen, you know, the solar industry in some case uh, give tacit uh, support or just fail to oppose policies that would shut down nuclear reactors, even though uh, down the road, flexibly operated nuclear reactors could be super important to integrating solar energy. And I've seen the enthusiasm for innovation start to wane as the solar industry focuses more and more on deployment of existing technology. Now, in many of these cases, I think some of these advocacy efforts have been um, less purposive and more neglectful. I think that that's why I wrote the report, to urge the solar industry to redouble its effort that I've seen in the past, to redouble its enthusiasm for things like innovation, which ultimately will hold the industry in good stead uh, and help its long-term success, not just its near-term prospects. Yeah, so you, you mentioned there briefly environmental groups, and I want to talk about that for, for just a moment. Environmental groups and the solar industry or renewables industries or clean energy industries broadly are not the same thing. But when it comes to solar in particular, there's a pretty big overlap. There's a pretty big enthusiasm among environmental groups and environmental activists for solar technologies. And I'm just sort of wondering what your thoughts on that overlap are. It, it is, on the one hand, a powerful coalition for advocacy, uh, but it won't surprise you to know that, that we at Breakthrough have had many critiques of the way that environmentalists and environmental organizations talk about energy and about clean energy uh, and about clean energy deployment and innovation. So I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. You know, Alex, say what you will about environmental groups. I will say that the the success to date of the pan-environmental trade union and solar industry advocacy coalition has been tremendous. We would not be where we are today without the efforts of, uh, for example, the environmental movement and the solar industry working hand in hand to get policies such as feed-in tariffs and mandates and subsidies passed that have helped to scale up a global solar industry, bring down the cost of solar. All that has been great. Um, and, and even you know, uh, you know, a couple decades ago and, and more recently to support investments in innovation. The problem is that going forward, I don't think that paradigm works anymore. I don't think it's useful to support direct subsidies, mandates, and incentives for the deployment narrowly uh, of solar power if what we really want going forward is a decarbonized grid at the lowest cost possible. And frankly, one that is led by solar power, which is our most abundant uh, source of energy. So going forward, I, I fear that the solar industry might let its agenda get co-opted by an environmental agenda, which may not be orthogonal to decarbonization, but not might not be entirely collinear. Sorry, I'll stop using these geometric analogies at some point. <laughs> um, really, what, what I want to see is that the solar industry should act. It, it's a growing industry with growing political clout. Uh, I mentioned some of the stats on 
you know, how big it is economically. It also employs over 250,000 people in the United States. In India, we could see a million solar jobs over the next decade. Like, it's going to be a really powerful industry. I don't want to see it move in lockstep with the environmental movement because oftentimes environmental groups have their own uh, objectives that may or may not align with cost optimal decarbonization. You know, they, uh, a, a particular environmental group might block a long distance transmission line for local environmental reasons, even though, you know, a larger grid is going to make it a lot easier to integrate a whole lot more solar power. Um, so ag- again, th- the reason I wrote this report and I, uh, you know, kind of ominously titled it "The Dark Side of Solar" was to say if we do, a, if the solar industry does allow itself to move in lockstep with the environmental movement and empower them as a result of its growing economic and political clout, well, it might empower the wrong sorts of policies if we're thinking about both cost optimal decarbonization and the solar industry's long term success. If we want a energy system where solar ultimately becomes humanity's primary final energy source, well we're then going to need to support a very different suite of policies than what this pan environmental solar advocacy coalition has supported in the past. That all sounds very right to me. One of the things that gives me hope about sort of today's environmental organizations is that they actually promote very often a technological solution to an environmental problem, which is the mission of the Breakthrough Institute to identify technological, modern and pragmatic solutions to environmental problems, wind, solar, batteries, these are potentially revolutionary technologies that can help us confront climate change, one of the biggest environmental problems we've ever faced. I share your hesitation, though, when the support for technology stops at the water's edge there, stops not only at solar, wind, batteries, what have you, but stops at the current generation of those technologies. So I'll I'll share your assessment on that. And I do want to say, Alex, um, I, I do want to be careful not to paint environmental groups with the same brush. Absolutely. You know, th- there's a wide spectrum of environmental groups, and, and some of them, as you mentioned, are uh, you know, very supportive of efforts to uh, uh, innovate, to produce new technologies, um, and efforts to bring together a big tent of uh, uh, zero-carbon technologies. So, so I think that there are environmental groups that are anti-tribalist on both of the dimensions that we talked about earlier, and those environmental groups should absolutely be celebrated. Absolutely. So you've written this book and you're continuing your research and trying to broadcast and amplify your ideas about solar innovation. I'm wondering what's next. Um, You know, as you tour these ideas around the country, as you talk to experts in solar, as you talk to other analysts and policymakers, what are your sort of personal and professional goals for accelerating a solar and broader clean energy agenda? Thanks for asking, Alex. You know, it's really been a learning experience for me. Um, And I will say that even though I've had the chance to talk to a lot of energy experts or energy insiders on this book tour, you know, I'm I think I'm on stop number 24 this evening at Johns Hopkins. um, The the most meaningful interactions for me have been with folks who largely had very little interaction with the energy industry or really with the energy Twitter debates that you and I, Alex, are uncomfortably familiar with. You know, these are folks who are just uh, interested in solar. They, they have, they've read the headlines. Uh, they want to know what the potential is. Um, they, they work across a range of disciplines. They're in finance. They're in technology. Um, you know, s- some folks who are in the solar industry but may not have a broad view of what all is going on in scientific laboratories or what's going on outside of their particular silo and are curious and want to learn. Those have been some of the best interactions I've had. And frankly, I've learned that I probably didn't do some things right in my book. I'll give you an example. Um, at, at the conclusion of reading my book, a lot of these folks will come to me and say, well, that's great. You just, you know, you, you threw 10 chapters at me and I feel a lot more informed, but I do not know what to do. What, what's my call to action? And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't really think through what the call to action is um, for, for an individual. I, I thought through a bunch of cases of what the call to action is not. You know, I, I don't think if you're an individual uh, and you live in a state that hasn't carefully thought through its net metering policies that you should be installing rooftop solar. Like that's probably not a good idea. You will end up shifting uh, the cost of paying for the network to somebody else who likely can't afford solar power. Um, you might incur more costs than you uh, than you defray. Um, you know, it's my message is not one of individual or personal sustainability. It's it's one of these systemic fixes. It's one of investing at a government level in innovation to embolden the private sector. So, so what can you do? 
Well, th- the one lesson that I think I can share is that I personally believe that there's a sweet spot for the level of solar deployment, the scale of solar deployment. It's definitely not on your roof, but it may also not be way out in the desert. I think the optimal level or scale of solar deployment is the megawatt scale. And communities can organize to install such sites that you know take advantage of economies of scale but are close enough to load centers that you don't have to spend a lot on expensive transmission and uh, transformer infrastructure. Um, anyway, that, that, that's one example of how uh, a, a personal call to action uh, can come out of this book. You and your community should band together and find a way to power your community through solar. Again, trying not to avoid or shift uh, network costs to other people. Um, finally, what, what's next for me? You know, it, it's been a little frustrating uh, in recent years to advocate for energy innovation funding for uh, technologies like solar or nuclear. It constantly feels like we're fighting an uphill battle. Um, but even as there's this kind of depressing tale of, you know, it's really hard to get new technologies for what we call hard tech or new materials and processes and manufacturing lines uh, out of the laboratory, um, it's becoming increasingly easy to get new digital technologies, technologies that are capital light, technologies that venture capitalists are more used to. It's easier to get those commercialized. And so I've been working on a new book. Uh, it's actually going to come out in June from the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and it's a already. Com- <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, so this one's a, a uh, uh, an edited volume. I'm just the editor. And I brought together a group of experts to write about different digital technologies. And many of these are fascinating and exciting digital technologies that might help to overcome the slow pace of innovation in these physical science innovations. Um, So, for example, if we're able to use machine learning uh, to make it easier to integrate renewable energy, for example, by better forecasting when renewable energy output will occur or making demand much more responsive, well, we may be able to mitigate value deflation and give ourselves a little more time to come up with innovative new solar technologies, given the slow pace of solar innovation. So, Digital technologies is next. I'm really excited for what digital technologies could do both to the electric power sector and to the transportation sector, for example, through uh, autonomous electrified fleets of vehicles. Well, that's really inspiring, Varun. And uh, we obviously agree with you that these kinds of innovations are hugely important um, opportunities for the 21st century. But outside of energy, uh, what's an example of progress or a source of optimism that you see in the world today? Emma, that's that was a curveball. Um but, but actually, now that you mention it, outside of energy is actually where I'm most optimistic. You know, the, the reason why I set such high standards for innovation within the energy sector is largely because of my experience outside of it as a, you know, I'm a Silicon Valley native. My dad was in the semiconductor industry, is in the semiconductor industry, and I've seen how fast they innovate and how much money companies plow back into R&D as a proportion of their revenues. You know, it's over 10% in comparison to less than 1% for the solar industry. So that's why I'm actually so optimistic about what technology can do for us. Um, Outside of the energy sector, I see remarkable technological gains happening in a range of fields, from machine learning and artificial intelligence to quantum computing, to robotics, to autonomous vehicles, to synthetic biology. Um, You know, there's just this, oh, uh, to, to, to space technologies, miniature satellites and, you know, reusable uh, launch vehicles. There's just so much happening outside of energy that I think we would do well to level set, to, to say, look, um, if everyone else is doing so well, why can't we do as well? And, and there are these structural barriers in energy. Energy is known as a legacy sector. And because we have entrenched incumbents and entrenched regulations and an enormous uh, stranded infrastructure, I shouldn't call it stranded yet, but it could be uh, if new technologies come to the fore, well, that's why there are these structural obstacles to new technologies being adopted at scale. Uh, that's why, you know, the on average, a cycle of energy transformation, whether from wood to coal to oil, on average, it takes like 60 years or more. Um, it makes sense that, that stuff would happen more slowly in energy. But I don't think we should give energy a free pass. And I think that looking at many of these other sectors in which we've had tremendous technological change should be inspiring and instructive. Well, here's hoping that energy can learn from those other industries. Varun, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Alex, thanks so much for having me. This is fun.
That's it for this episode of Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us on iTunes, and subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts. We want to again thank our guests, Varun, and our producers, Alyssa Kadaman and Tali Perlman. Until next time, I'm Alex Trembath. And I'm Emma Brush. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.